Well, it's good to be back with you again this week. Uh, we're going to be uh, continuing talking about uh, holiness and actually uh, some of the marks of holiness and the pathway to holiness, which are the spiritual disciplines. Uh, last week, one of the things we looked at uh, was how God's salvation, the salvation that comes to us by grace through faith in Christ, how that salvation works itself out in our lives. And we, uh, we talked about uh, three essential elements uh, of salvation, the first being justification. And we were reminded that to be justified is to be legally declared not guilty of sin. Uh, this happens at the moment we put our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ. At that moment we trust Christ, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, and uh, the penalty for our sin has, has been paid by Jesus himself when he died on the cross. And so again, uh, legally, we are declared not guilty in spite of the fact that in actuality, uh, we have sinned and still do sin. But because Jesus pays the full penalty for every sin, past, present, and future, uh, we are declared not guilty. That's justification. Again, that takes place or has taken place if you're a Christian. That took place in your past at the moment when you put your trust in Jesus. A second essential element of salvation, a second way sal salvation is worked out in our lives, is, uh, is, the, is a future element of salvation called glorification. And glorification is what we look forward to at the coming of Christ. And when Jesus comes again, uh, we will be completely sanctified. Uh, all sin uh, will be purged from us. We'll never be tempted again. Uh, we'll never sin again. And we will never be in the presence of sin again. We will uh, have glorified bodies and we will live in a new heaven and a new earth where only righteousness dwells. So we look forward to glorification in the future. Uh, that brings us to sanctification. And uh, sanctification is that part of salvation, that element of salvation uh, that takes place as a process from the time that we put our trust in Jesus Christ, from the time that we're justified, as we wait to be glorified, uh, God is working his salvation out in our lives through this process of sanctifying us. And that means simply to be progressively transformed into uh, the image and into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ, to be progressively made holy. Uh, in actuality, in the way that we think and live uh, our lives out. And so we have been concerned with that second or that third part of salvation, sanctification. That's what we've been concerned with this, this past Tuesday and tonight. We'll continue to speak about that and how God does in fact sanctify us. Uh, tonight we will begin by considering some of the marks of God's sanctifying work in our lives, some of the uh, areas of our lives uh, where we should be seeing progress uh, in becoming more like Christ. And uh, we will also see how the practice of spiritual disciplines is a means that God uses uh, to make us progressively more and more like Jesus. Uh, before we, we uh, look at the marks of uh, sanctification, some of the marks of sanctification. I want to just briefly review of what we looked, uh, what we talked about last Tuesday night. Uh, we began by looking at the holiness of God, and then uh, we came to uh, the point where we asked the question, why should we as Christians strive to be holy? Why is holiness so important in our lives? Why is, is becoming more and more like Christ over time why is that not an option in our lives if we truly are born again believers? And there were several things we touched on from scripture. And the first is, if we're truly believers in Christ, if we're serious about the salvation we have in him, serious about following him as Lord, uh, we are interested and we strive to be holy because holiness is God's command to us. And that alone should be enough. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 116 is where God says, uh, be holy as I am holy. And so it's a command of God that as believers saved by Christ, 
uh, his intent is to conform us into the image of Christ, and we are commanded to cooperate with God uh, in that process. Another reason that I think too often we overlook is we should strive to be holy as Christians because our holiness literally is, is a purpose for which Christ died. Now, I think almost everyone knows and that Christ died to pay the penalty for our sin so we could be delivered from hell. But I think too often that's where we stop when we think about the purpose of Christ when he died on the cross. Uh, just one passage we looked at last week was Titus chapter 2, 14. And it says clearly, uh, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, gave himself on the cross, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So a clear statement from Scripture that Jesus Christ died on the cross not just to deliver us from hell, but to purify us and to make us holy, to purify for himself a people, again, anxious to do good works. So always remember that Jesus didn't just die to save you from hell. Jesus died to purify you. He died to purify us together as a people of God. Now the third thing we looked at in terms of why we as Christians strive to be holy is simply because holiness gives evidence of salvation and brings assurance of our salvation. Again, uh, salvation is made up of three essential elements, uh, justification, forgiveness of sin, uh, glorification, our future with Christ, but also sanctification. And all three of those essential elements will mark our lives if we truly belong to Jesus. God doesn't just save people partially. If, uh, if you say you've been justified, but you're not being sanctified, uh, you probably need to go back to the beginning and make sure that you have truly put your faith in Jesus Christ. So when we see sanctification happening in our lives, when we see and, and, and know the power uh, that we never had before over sin, that's when we begin uh, to, to truly have assurance of salvation. When you see God changing your heart, when you see God changing your, even your attitudes towards sin, then you can be certain the Holy Spirit is in your life and that you belong to Jesus. So holiness, our growth in holiness, gives real evidence that we truly do belong to Jesus. And that holiness, uh, that uh, progressive uh, overcoming of sin in our life is really what brings assurance to us. Uh, the fourth thing that we saw why strive to be holy? Holiness prepares us for heaven. We understand what our salvation entails, that we, uh, we have been saved, and we have the promise of a future in a new heavens and a new earth where Second Peter tells us only righteousness dwells. Then it is very much our concern and desire to already begin to prepare ourselves for that place. Uh, and so holiness, uh, as we... As we look towards heaven, we want to become more and more holy in preparing ourselves for our, our eternal home. And finally, uh, for every believer, because every believer is called to be a minister, every believer is given spiritual gifts, uh, every believer is called to serve uh, the world and serve in the body of Christ, uh, we need to understand that holiness is essential uh, to ministry. Holiness is essential to effective service to God. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 3, uh, the apostle there speaks to elders in the church, but he tells them to not, not lead by dominating people, by commanding people and barking out orders. He, he tells elders to lead by example. And I think that's, uh, that's a word to all of us in whatever ministries we have. Your ministry at home as a parent, uh, spouse, uh, your ministry Sunday school teacher, your ministry in teaching, preaching. Uh, we are to lead people not just by what we say, but by how we live. Because uh, when we teach, when we preach, uh, when we tell people about Christ, uh, 
People are not just listening to what we say. They're also watching how we live. And if the way we live doesn't match in any way the words we speak, uh, we can be certain that our ministry, our outreach, uh, will have no impact, no real impact uh, in the lives of others. Now, the, the second thing, I guess i got to remember now to switch slides. Uh, the, another thing that we covered uh, as we talked about sanctification, as we talked about uh, personal holiness in our lives, we, we looked at what is the nature of this holiness that the Bible speaks of. Uh, it's pretty intimidating to hear the Word of God t tell us, uh, you know, God is holy, now be holy like He's holy. Uh, man, that's perfection. Is that the kind of holiness uh, we should strive for? Probably you should strive for it, but also you need to have a recognition that that's not going to happen in this life because the Bible itself tells us uh, we are not going to be perfect in this life. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, that if we say we have no sin, if we say we've reached perfection, uh, we're deceived and the truth is not in us. So we need to understand uh, what this holiness is and what it's going to look like in your life and mine as true believers of Jesus. And the first thing we were reminded of is that the holiness that the Bible calls us to as Christians is not an outward obedience to a list of rules. Uh, Jesus makes that clear when he talks about, you heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, for instance. Uh, but Jesus says if you just adhere to the outward law and you don't physically commit adultery, he said that's not the kind of holiness God's looking for. Because Jesus goes on and say, you can avoid physical adultery and still commit adultery in your heart. What God is looking for is a transformation of the inner being of your heart and not just an outward obedience to a list of rules. In fact, that just leads to pride and it also leads to legalism. And that's not, uh, that's not the holiness God's Word speaks of. So the holiness we're called to is not simply an external holiness of obeying a set of rules. Uh, rather, uh, holiness, rather than being perfected, perfection, in, in this world for us as Christians really is demonstrated by our progress and by our continued growth in Christ. First uh, Timothy chapter 4, Paul speaks to this young pastor and he tells Timothy, uh, you lead, don't let people disrespect you because of your age, because of your youth, rather lead them by example. Let them see uh, your own growth in various areas of, of holiness in your life. And then he says, let them see your progress in the faith. And so the idea of holiness, the idea of being sanctified, if you will, in, in this world, in our lives as Christians, is the idea of progressively becoming more and more like Christ. Christian growth, progress in the faith, that's what you're looking for in your life. Don't be discouraged uh, when you're not perfect because you're not going to be. Uh, that you Expect not to be, but still strive uh, to conform your life to Christ. And that, again, is, is the third thing we saw about what the nature of this holiness is that God calls us to. It is a growing, it is a progressive conformity to the character of Christ himself, to the character of God. God, God's own nature and Christ's own character really set the standard for what it means to live a godly life. And again, that really starts internally, not externally. It's a transformation of the heart, and that transformation continues day by day in our walk with Christ in this world. And the last thing we, we took note of last week was that holiness has to uh, be marked by a life that is set apart from this world. Again, a progressive thing, but less. But, but as we go on with Christ, we are less and less shaped uh, by the opinions of this world, by the standards of this world. Romans 12, 1 and 2, of course, we are told, uh, don't be conformed 
uh, to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if your world, I'm sorry, if your life as a Christian uh, looks like the lives of everybody else who's an unbeliever, if the, the way you think and the way you act uh, aligns itself with the way the world thinks and acts, uh, that's the time to step back and ask yourself where you really stand with God. Uh, because the more you go on with Christ, the less you should think and act like this world. Uh, so that's just a review of last week, which brings us to what's this life going to look like uh, as we grow in holiness? What are some of the marks of a holy life? And I'm going to touch on just a few uh, of these things that uh, marks of a Christian, of, of a life that's growing in holiness. Certainly there are many more. Uh, but I do want to want to touch on just a few, just to give you an example of areas in our lives where, in fact, we should be seeing progress and growth. In terms of what it means to to live a holy life and a mark of a holy life, we start with uh, the uh, the sharing more and more of God's heart and God's mind. If we are being transformed by God's Spirit, then as time goes on, we will more and more uh, share the same heart and mind as God. Now we see that uh, it's stated in a, in a number of Psalms, in the, in the Old Testament of course. Psalm 139.17 How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. There David uh, expresses a desire to share the mind of God. Uh, also Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now that's the cry, that's the prayer of someone who desires to share the heart and the mind of God. Lord, let my thoughts be like your thoughts. And then uh, Psalm 119, verse 24, uh, where the psalmist writes, Lord, your testimonies are my delight, and they are my counselors. And so the more you grow in Christ, uh, the more he works in this process of sanctification in your heart, the more you will share uh, God's heart, God's opinions, God's mind. Now, we see, uh, again, we come back to King David, Acts 13, uh, verse 22, uh, speaks of David and shows us that this is exactly what happened in King David's life in his walk with God. And we know that David was not a perfect man. Uh, and yet, Acts 13.22 declares, He, that is God, raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Uh, isn't that something you'd love to have God say about you as you continue to walk with God and grow in him? Uh, someone who strives and hungers to share the mind and the heart of God. Uh, J.C. Ryle, who was a, a bishop in the Anglican Church uh, in the 1800s, uh, he, he has a, a great statement concerning this. He says, He who most entirely agrees with God, he is a most holy man. So as we grow in our walk with Christ, uh, more and more, uh, our hearts, our thinking, our minds will conform uh, to God's own heart and God's own mind. So I hope that's a, a prayer that we all pray. Lord, give us your heart, give us your mind. Uh, now another, uh, I think, very important mark of holiness and one I think that needs to be more emphasized, at least if you're like me, pride is such uh, sometimes a subtle sin, uh, sometimes one we don't spot too often. 
uh, I mean, when it's blatant, but sometimes pride can be pretty subtle in our lives, in our thinking. Humility is, is a critical element of the holiness God looks for in our lives as Christians. And so we see in Scripture, uh, we know from Scripture in so many passages that God hates pride. Uh, let me just give you a, a few uh, passages here. Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And so we, we need to take care when we find ourselves uh, building ourselves up, trying to build ourselves up in the eyes of others. Uh, Philippians 2.3. This is Paul's word to uh, a church. Uh, a church that was really uh, in, in a good place in terms of the life of their congregation, and yet within the church there, there was a situation where there was some division. And in answering that division, uh, Paul says to them, do nothing, this is Philippians 2.3, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, there's that element of pride again, but in humility, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Uh, so part of humility means that we, we esteem others, uh, we serve others, in ways that uh, that we see them in in the life of the church, perhaps even as more significant than we ourselves, we take our eyes off ourselves and put them on others. First Timothy one fifteen, we are told Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Now this is just a place where Paul himself expresses humility. Uh, here's the apostle Paul who probably was used by God more than any other man, perhaps in the history of the church. And you'll find as you read through Paul, uh, the various letters, uh, that as he matures in Christ, his statements uh, concerning his own, uh, his own life and his own sinfulness actually increase in intensity. Uh, initially, in one place uh, in the New Testament, he's a... He's a sinner, uh, and then he's a sinner more than others. And here, uh, this last statement he makes concerning his own sin, he says he's the worst of all sinners. And, and I believe that as he got closer to God, as he grew closer to God, um, one of the, the impacts of that is that the closer you get to the holiness of God, the more you will recognize your own sin and your own shortcomings. Uh, which isn't something to be discouraged about because the more you recognize the depth of your sin, frankly, the more you uh, recognize the magnificence of God's grace. And, and that's the way it should work in each of our lives as, as we go through our life growing closer and closer to God. Uh, James Denny, uh, a theologian of 100, 150 years ago, uh, made a statement that always kind of strikes me. Uh, because this is a, a temptation uh, that I face uh, day by day, week by week as a pastor. Uh, James Denny uh, says, uh, no one, no man can bear witness to Christ and to himself at the same time. No man can give at once the impression that he himself is clever and that Christ is mighty to save. That statement really cuts at me because so often I find myself when I when I uh, when I really evaluate sometimes my motivations, or when God taps me on the shoulder and and says, uh, "Are you here to glorify me or yourself?" Uh, because how often I do desire to be thought of as clever, and uh, this is a great reminder to me. Humility means uh, in ministry, my goal is to magnify Jesus Christ, and and to as much as humanly possible get out of the way in terms of trying to draw attention to myself. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, another uh, uh, pastor from 100, 150 years ago named Robert Murray Shane, a Scottish pastor, he writes, uh, pray for more knowledge of your own heart 
of the total depravity of it, of the awful depths of corruption there. Now, Machane isn't writing that uh, so that we'll wallow in our own sin. His point is simply this. The more we truly open ourselves to having our sin exposed, the, the, the less likely we will be to succumb to the sin of pride. And again, the more we'll be able to, to magnify uh, the grace of God that first worked in our lives, as we share that grace with others. Now having said that, I also want us to understand that when we speak of humility, um, we're not speaking of this, this kind of attitude of, of all shucks, you know. If somebody compliments you, well it wasn't me, it was just the Lord, and that may be true. Uh, but real humility that doesn't necessarily mean you act that way or speak that way. Because there is an element of real confidence uh, in, in biblical humility. Uh, and we see that, uh, I don't have a slide for this, but we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. This is Paul speaking about his own ministry. And you will see that Paul was a supremely confident man as a minister and as an apostle. But I want you to notice where his confidence is placed, because that's the key issue. Humility is not the absence of confidence, but it's confidence placed in the right person. So let me just read uh, 2 Corinthians 3 verses 4 through 6, where Paul says, such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. What do you hear there? First of all, Paul is confident. We have confidence, Paul says, through Christ towards God, but he also says, in that confidence, we understand we are not sufficient in ourselves in this ministry. Our confidence is in God. It's God who makes us competent. And isn't that the truth for all of us in whatever ministry he's called us to? Again, the Bible's teaching on spiritual gifts. What God calls you to do in your service to him, he will enable you to do it. And often he'll call us to things we'd never dreamed that we would be involved in simply so we'll know uh, that the effectiveness of that ministry comes from God and not ourselves. So never forget, humility is not the absence of confidence. Biblical humility is simply taking your eyes off yourself and putting your whole confidence in the work of God, in your heart, in your life, uh, to make you useful to Him. Uh, by the way, uh, I think another thing that that says to us is, when God calls you uh, to serve Him, He will often call you to serve in places uh, that, are, that you will recognize as being way over your head. Which means if you're going to be used by God, uh, you probably ought to accept the reality that He's going to call you to serve you out, to serve Him outside of your comfort zone. So if you are at a place where you're refusing to do ministry because, well, I'm just not comfortable with that, or I don't think I could do that, uh, you're probably not going to be used much by God. Uh, because until He gets you out of your comfort zone, until He gets you, in a sense, in over your head, uh, the confidence you have in ministry will be in yourself and not in Him. So He will take you out of your comfort zone, and all I can say is bite the bullet and go for it. Uh, because it's those times when God has called me to serve in places that I actually knew I had nothing to offer. It's in those times that I, I have most experienced the power and the grace of God in my life and ministry. Uh, so next time you're a pastor, uh, next time uh, your church family, next time someone in need uh, ask you uh, to serve in a way that you don't feel comfortable, uh, go for it. Go for it and see what God will do.
Uh, one more thing about humility and why humility is so very important in ministry is because uh, without humility, without biblical humility in your life, uh, you really won't pray often and I don't think you'll pray very effectively. This is a lesson I'm still trying to learn in my own life. But the reality is prayer is an expression of humility. Uh, when we are proud enough that we think we've got it handled in terms of ministry, our life in general, uh, we don't pray. When we know it all depends on God, when we know that we are not gifted enough, uh, are not empowered enough in and of ourselves, that's when we look to God. That's when we depend on God. And dependence on God is what drives prayer. Uh, Charles Spurgeon spoke of this in terms of, of what this would mean for a pastor. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, again, was a, was a great uh, pastor, famous pastor in England in the 1800s. Uh, and he wrote, The minister who does not earnestly pray over his work must surely be a vain and conceited man. He acts as though he thought himself sufficient of himself, and therefore needed not to appeal to God. Yet what a baseless pride to conceive that our preaching can ever be in itself so powerful that it can turn men from their sins and bring them to God without the working of the Holy Ghost. So again, what Spurgeon is telling us, reminding us of, if, if we're not praying, in our life and in our ministry, uh, that's a red flag. That's a warning that we have probably succumbed to an attitude of pride and independence from God. Humility will drive us to prayer, and that's one reason why it is so critical uh, in our lives uh, and in our character. And that's why it's such an important mark of growing holiness, growing sanctification in our lives. Now there's a second uh, character trait I want to look at, one I think that we maybe don't talk about enough, but one I think that is as important as any, and that would be uh, as we grow in holiness, we will also grow in our attitude of contentment. Now, what I mean is contentment in where God has placed you and what kind of life God has given you, uh, what kind of income, all those things play into this idea of contentment. Now contentment uh, is critical. I'm going to read a verse that on the surface may not seem like it applies to contentment, uh, but I'm going to read Romans 1.21. Uh, it's a, a verse that's in the context of, of Paul talking about the Gentiles, idolaters, those who do not follow God. He talks about how God reveals himself to all people in the world through creation. And then in verse 21, he says, For although they, although unbelievers, they knew God, they did not honor him as God. And here's the key phrase, I think, or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now I read this verse. Uh, because I believe that ingratitude, the refusal to give thanks to God, is actually a, an expression of discontent. Uh, ingratitude flows out of a heart that is not content in the life God has given. And verse 21 reminds us that such ingratitude and such discontent towards God really underlies almost every other kind of sin that we see in the world. Let me give you the example of the first sin, uh, Adam and Eve in, in the garden. If you recall in Genesis chapter 2, uh, God takes Adam and shows him the garden and says to Adam, uh, you, uh, you have access to all this beauty, you have access to the fruit of every tree in this garden, it's all yours. It's all yours, except for one tree. Uh, 
have anything you want, enjoy everything you want, except the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he gives them all things and withholds only one thing. And what was the point at which Satan tempted them? The one thing that God said they could not have. Satan tempted Eve uh, and Adam standing there next to her. Satan tempted them in chapter 3 by causing them to take their eyes off everything God had given them and causing them to focus on the one thing he had withheld. And he stirred within them discontent and that led to disobedience to God. And so it's no wonder that one of the Ten Commandments, now the Tenth Commandment, is the commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything else that is your neighbor's. Because, of course, coveting is an expression of discontent. Uh, God calls us to be content what he has given to us, the life he has given to us, rather than begin to look around at the life that he's given to someone else. And again, we see how this underlies uh, so many other sins. Why does divorce happen? Why does adultery take place? Does it not start with discontent with the spouse that God has given you? Uh, theft, uh, underlying that is discontent uh, with the income or the prosperity financially that God has given you. Uh, we can go on and on, but discontent underlies so many uh, other sins that it's just important to understand that if we are to grow, and if we are growing in sanctification, if we are becoming more holy, more like Christ, one way that that will express itself is in contentment with all that God has provided to us. Uh, I want to look uh, at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. Uh, again, that's chapter 6. I left a chapter out of that reference there. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, because I think Paul gives us two principles that help us in terms of uh, contentment. Paul says, now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. And it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I think God, Paul gives us two principles there that can help us uh, deal with the temptation uh, to covet and, and to want that which God has not ordained for us. I think the first principle we see here in this passage is don't crave what you can't keep. Don't crave what you can't keep forever. Uh, Paul says, he reminds us, uh, we brought nothing into the world, and we're not going to take anything with us out of it. So if it's not eternal, it's not worth uh, coveting, it's not worth craving. Uh, the second principle that can help us in terms of our perspective when it comes to contentment is we need to adjust our thinking uh, to expect from God only what we need. Uh, too often our expectations go far beyond our needs to our wants. Now if you and I were to live our lives expecting only what we need, Paul says uh, if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. Uh, if we really lived our life with that attitude, uh, then everything God added on top of our needs we would see simply as a gift of grace from God and, and worship him all the more for his abundance and, his, and his, uh, his generosity to us. But we do need to remember that what God has promised us is to meet our needs. He doesn't promise us to give us all our wants. So if we remember that, that will help us in contentment and also it will make us more grateful for everything that he adds and gives to us above and beyond those needs. Uh, 
Uh, so fight against, uh, you and I as Christians need to fight against this attitude of entitlement that so easily grips us. Uh, we have Christ. Uh, what else do we need? Uh, there's uh, another thing we need to just point out. Paul in Philippians says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And then he talks about uh, he's learned uh, how to be content in hunger and in plenty. And he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a, a verse we quote a lot. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But we need to remember that the primary application of that promise, I can do all things in Christ, applies to our ability to be content uh, in every circumstance. So contentment is something God calls us to learn. Paul says, I've learned to be content. And often the way he teaches us contentment, often the way he helps us learn contentment, is to take us through difficult times. Uh, so that we can learn to be grateful for what he provides, even when it may not be everything we would want in, in our own sinful desires. Uh, so again, contentment is something we learn, and we need to strive for that. Uh, one, one last passage, I think a very important passage when it comes to contentment, Hebrews 13, 5, where the writer says, Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now there's a promise in that passage. I will never leave you or forsake you. If we believe that promise, that we have Christ, uh, believing that promise empowers us to obey that command to keep our life free from the love of money. Uh, because when we have Christ and we believe we have Christ, we have everything. And that puts a whole new perspective on the things of this world that we so easily go after that, that will mean nothing in eternity. So contentment, again, is, is a very important uh, mark of, of growth in holiness, growth in our life and walk with Christ. Uh, another mark would be uh, courage. Uh, the, uh, in Revelation, uh, the Apostle John writes, but as for the cowardly, uh, the faithless, and detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their portion will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. There we see that the Apostle John uh, actually puts uh, fear, uh, being a coward, uh, right in there with sins like faithlessness, murder and immorality. It's a, it's a serious thing. And the reason is, is because if we are to minister for Christ, if we are to proclaim the gospel, that takes courage. Uh, in uh, Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, Don't fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Now when we talk about courage, again, uh, just like humility is not the total absence of confidence, uh, courage is not the total absence of fear. Courage, biblical courage, has to do with fearing the right one. Rather than fearing God, rather, I'm sorry, scratch that last statement, rather than fearing the world, uh, we learn to fear God. And fearing God gives us the courage to stand and speak the truth. Uh, courage is courage happens not when you are free from an emotion of fear. Courage happens when you do the right thing. Courage is when you obey God in spite of your fear. And that's when we will stand and speak the truth in love to those who need to hear the whole truth, that they're sinners, that hell is real, and only then can they understand their need for salvation and only then uh, can, do they have the opportunity to put their faith in Christ. But it takes courage to speak the truth about sin, uh, judgment, and the whole gospel. Uh, we need courage to do that, and we need courage to stand for the truth of God's word 
in a world that hates him. Um, that courage comes from the Holy Spirit. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 7 and 8. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Do not be uh, afraid to suffer uh, for the gospel. So courage is another mark of growing holiness in your life. The courage to speak for God, to live for God, uh, even when you have to stand alone. A third or, or another element which I think is very obvious or should be obvious to us is moral purity. This is important, uh, and I fear sometimes that we don't understand how important it is in our present culture, even in our churches. But Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, again, 1 Corinthians 6, 18-20, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now what we learn from Scripture, what's so obvious in, in the epistles, is sexual immorality is not compatible with true salvation in Jesus Christ. Uh, anyone who says, I am saved, uh, but has no sense of conviction, uh, no sense of restraint in their sexual life and willing to engage in immorality and still claim to be a child of God, uh, that can't be true. That can't be true. Not according to Scripture. And so we need also to understand, though, when we talk about immorality, that we're also talking not just about our bodies but about our minds as well. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 5.27, You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Uh, this, of course, would include the issue of pornography. Uh, there's a poll that was done around a survey around 2009 in which 51% of pastors admit to occasionally visiting a pornographic website. 37% of those pastors admitted to having a problem with pornography. Uh, this shouldn't be. Uh, and I think part of the issue is, again, it's a powerful, powerful temptation. Uh, and I understand the what we call the addictive nature of pornography. But I almost think we come to a place where we decide it's just too hard. Uh, this past Sunday I preached in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 8 and Paul speaks in that passage, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And then in verse 8 he says, therefore whoever disregards this, disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So after spending, again, seven verses talking about how incompatible immorality is with being a Christian, in the last verse, he speaks to this issue by saying, if you disregard this command to abstain from immorality, you're not disregarding people, you're disregarding God himself, and God has given you his Holy Spirit. Now, why does he say that? He says it because it's the Holy Spirit who gives us power to overcome the sin. So to deny that you have the power within you as a Christian to resist and to do battle uh, against immorality is to deny the power of God's Spirit within you. So take steps to do battle. Uh, there's not going to be probably an instant, if you're, if you're caught up in pornography, it's not going to be like throwing a light switch 
and you're going to be totally free. But on the other hand, you've got to take up the fight. You've got to understand the spirits within you. And you've got to find some accountability. You've got to take some steps. Whatever you need to do. If you need to trash your computer, then trash it. Uh, but you need to fight the fight because you have the power within you. It's the Holy Spirit. And you need to set it aside and you need to do battle. Uh, the last uh, thing we look, we were going to look at is temperance, and I'll let you look at your notes on that. But temperance simply means uh, to do things in moderation. Uh, we're to avoid excesses, uh, whether, than, whether that means being a workaholic, uh, whether that means uh, you're a glutton, uh, you have no control over your eating habits, uh, these things are issues of temperance, and as you grow in holiness, you will also grow in your ability uh, to enjoy all the gifts that God gives us, but to do so in a moderation uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't uh, bring uh, dishonor to the gospel of God. Uh, so we'll stop there, and uh, we we've, we've just talked about some of the marks. Uh, of a whole of, of growing holiness in your life, some of the areas of your life that that will touch, and next hour we will talk about uh, the pathway to holiness, which is the spiritual disciplines. Uh, hope you have a great discussion time.